Good morning, church. The uh, scripture reading is Romans 4.17, and it says, As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations, in the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the death and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Well, I think after hearing the Hesson sing, we can say we've had church. Amen. This church is blessed with music, isn't it? Amen. We can, we can hear that group again. Uh, amen. Amen. We're just blessed with music. And I think of all of our musicians, I'm, I'm so thankful for all of them. I'm not blessed that way. And uh, if you've heard me singing, you know that. But uh, I'm just thankful for this church. For all of our young people, I'm thankful for them that... We had all the birthdays here for today. And I think of the musicians, we often don't say thank you to those who like the piano player and Pat Amen. on the organ, you know, and, and they're, they're quietly do their job. And we need to say thank you to them too. Thanks so much for Amen. your faithful service and being here so often. Yeah. And I wanna ask everybody here today, if I, I haven't heard about Pat and uh, Jean's daughter, and so would you not remember them today with me? And, and uh, would you not lift up your, your, your prayers for them this week? Could I say a commitment? Amen. Amen. Well, that is, uh, that, is, that is a big deal. And uh, so we are praying for you. Be sure of that for you as, you as you as sister. And she is a member of this church. So we should be praying for her every day. So let's, uh, let's uh, pray for them. Well, uh, you know, today, whatever's going on in your life, and there's, everybody has their challenges, I want to say that we're kind of in God's waiting room. Uh, you know, uh, we are. We, we're kind of waiting to see how God is going to work this thing out. Whether it might be whatever it is, uh, uh, Hoping the Lord will come soon. I mean, we all believe that. We want to see that. But it might be your job, a relationship, a financial situation, or illness. There's all kinds of problems that many of us have, and we're anxious to see the Lord answer it. In fact, we're anxious about many things, not only in our lives, but in the world as we look around. And we wonder, uh, we sometimes wonder, is God really in control? But let me assure you today, He is. God is sovereign. He's looking after the affairs of this world and in your life and mine. And I just want to uh, assure you of that today. And when we can look back, and, and I can look back at my own experience and know how God has led me step by step. And, uh, but as we look back and through eternity, we'll be able to say, you know, really it, it, we can see that God was leading. And even though we can't see it right now, we can't see it. And I want you to turn with me, if you would, to Ecclesiastes. It may not be the most used portion of your Bible, but it's right after Proverbs. Ecclesiastes, the third chapter, and verse 11. Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, and verse 11. Have you found it? Okay. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 11, it says, He has made everything beautiful in His time. He's put eternity in, our, in, in their hearts. Except no one can find out that God, uh, what, that God does from beginning to end. We don't really comprehend it all. Paul talks about the mystery of godliness and how many of these things are going to be worked out. We don't know. But in his time, it'll all look beautiful when we can look back from eternity and see God's leading in our lives. I want to take this text, and I'm going to refer to it. And maybe the text I want to refer to several times today, and if you don't get anything else from what I say today, I hope you'll remember this text. And turn with me to Romans. And thank you, Luke, for reading that. Uh, Romans uh, chapter 4 and verse 17. 
Now this is, uh, as you look for that, think about this is the story of Abraham. We're not going to go back and look at this in, in Genesis uh, when I have time for that, but I want to just, this, this, uh, this next few verses will kind of give a, a capsule of, of what happened to him. And uh, Romans chapter 4 and verse 17, if you'll turn there with me. It says, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of him, God, it's talking about whom he, Abraham, believed, even God, who gives life to the dead, calls things which do not exist as though they do. He calls things which do not exist as though they do. Uh, that's, a, that's an amazing text to me. And uh, maybe it's just a little different and why it, somehow it jumps out to me. But God calls things to exist that, uh, that, that were not. So as we think about this, the life of Abraham. I, I read a book recently called Jews, God, and History. And it's written by a Jewish historian. Now, this historian was not a believer, well, not an Orthodox Jew or or a believer in God necessarily. He, I'm sure from what I read, he didn't believe in the miracles in the Old Testament. But he went through the amazing thing of the Jewish nation and the descendants of Abraham. Now, for years we've referred to Abraham as the father of the faithful, the father of the Jews, the father of the Christians, the father of the Muslims. Abraham is father of the faithful. Now this author points out that there's seven and a half billion, with a B, seven and a half billion people in the world. There are only 14 million Jews in the world. And that represents just three tenths of 1% of the population. It's a very small amount. Three tenths of 1% of the population is Jewish. From that have come uh, two billion Christians, and 1.4 billion Muslims, and of course the 14 million Jews. He points out how they've lived this history of now 4,000 years since the call of Abraham. And he shows how, that, uh, how it really is impossible that this small group could survive 4,000 years and all the persecution, all the things that happened to them. It's just, and he, of course, credits it to their unique culture. But for instance, Greece lasted, lasted 500 years. It's disappeared from history. I mean, basically today they don't play a major role in the world. And many of the, it's really, they produce more herdsmen than anything else. So you think of Rome, the centuries that they ruled. And, of course, Italy today is a great nation, but not anything like ancient Rome. Um, and the other people who battle with the, with the historical Jews uh, and Israel, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Phoenicians, and the Hittites, those people have disappeared from history. Nobody knows who they are or where their descendants are today. Well, we know where the Persians are, but they're not a nation of Persia. is not a nation itself. It's something different now. And, uh, well, we uh, think of what they lived through under all of those, all of those regimes, and, and somehow they've managed to prosper. Somehow they managed to overcome everything. It says, God calls things which are not as though they were. So through Abraham, we have this tremendous heritage that we have as Christians today. Now, uh, I want to go on and, and read the rest of this this text that gives Abraham's history here, starting with verse 18. If you look there with me. It says, Who, contrary to hope, hope in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations. And by the way, uh, according to what uh, was spoken, so shall your descendants be. Let, turn with me a minute to keep that your place there, and then turn with me to Galatians, the third chapter. And verse 29, Galatians 3, verse 29. Sometimes if you hear people preaching on the radio today or on television and they get into this thing about Israel today and its place, 
uh, you know, they don't really understand. They miss something big. And this text says it. It says, if we are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. If we are Christ, we are Abraham's seed. It is not the nation of Israel. We are Israel, spiritual Israel. Amen? Amen. Uh, so we, we are spiritual Israel. And so if you hear that, you can just say, hey, no, the Bible says if you're Christ, then you are Abraham's and heirs according to the promise. Now, in, in the faith chapter in Hebrews, it says that they were looking for a city who was none other than God's, it was God's city because it said whose maker was and architect was God. They were looking for that city that you and I are looking for when Jesus comes again. So the life of Abraham, this tremendous history. This fellow, though, in my opinion, he missed two really big points uh, in, in his, as, as he studied the history of the Jewish nation. Number one, these people who kept uh, detail, they're detail people, even today. I mean, they, they are. You, uh, you look at them and where they are in business and things, and look at the influence they have. Uh, he missed two points. And one of them is that the Jews, the Jews preserved the canon of the Old Testament. The, the, the inspired words of the Old Testament, the Old Testament canon, it was preserved by the Jewish nation. And if without them, we wouldn't have that. They kept it perfectly. A great example, of course, is the Dead Sea Scrolls. They were buried 150 years before Christ came in the flesh. And they were buried in a cave outside in the desert outside uh, Jerusalem where there's no round half inch or any year in, the, in a jar where there is a dry cave. And of course, there's no bacteria there to, dis, to eat the scroll. And that was preserved until a man herding goats found them. And, and that was in 1948 as it eventually became known what they had. So they, they, those were buried, those were out of sight for 2,000, for 2000 years. And we know that they were, nobody saw them in between that. And we know that, that if you can read your book of Isaiah, it reads exactly like the Dead Sea Scroll, the book of Isaiah. And uh, those who can read the original text says, you, if you read it, it looks just like God has preserved his word. And the Jews have been God's instrument that did that. The second thing he really missed is that the Jews preserve the Sabbath through those 4,000 years. They cannot, no one can explain why we have a seven day week except they look back to creation. And the Jews kept that for us so we know today when the Sabbath is. So uh, this is, a, to me, it says God calls things which are not as though they were. He called the Jewish nation as though they were. There was no Jewish nation. Uh, there was no Jew when Abraham was called to wander in the desert and live in a tent. God calls things which are not as though they were. My second illustration for this is um, the flood. Now the flood, oh let me, oh I'm, I'm sorry, I, let me finish reading those texts following there on uh, from 17 and 18 on down, uh, 19. It says, and not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body, speaking of Abraham, already dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, being fully convinced that he had what he had promised, what God had promised, he's fully convinced. He also was able to perform. Therefore, it accounted to him for righteousness. So, he believed, and because he believed, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, he was not a perfect man, and you and I are not perfect people, but as, uh, but Abraham believed and followed the Lord. And if we do that, it will be counted for us for righteousness. It doesn't mean that we have reached perfection, but we're all working on it. And we're not the same person we were as, as uh, 
as Marty said this morning in Sabbath school. But I'm not the same person that I was. I, I'm not the same person I was, but I'm not the person that I'm going to be, if I got his quote right. But uh, so uh, this is uh, an amazing story. My second point, though, was the flood. God calls things to exist as if they did. Uh, so, for instance, if, imagine if you lived in the pre-flood world. People were living hundreds of years. And you saw life go on and on and on. And can you imagine if you lived in that time and some powerful people got control, such as uh, Mao Zedong, who killed more people really than even Stalin or, or Hitler. If, if someone like that got control, can you imagine what a miserable world it must have been? And yet, uh, th th what could be? And yet there were still God's people. God called Noah in all of that, in that flood. And he gave him a message. And he said, I'm going to give them 120 years. And it's going to rain water from the sky. Now, at this time, all the earth, the Bible says, was watered with a mist. It says it's watered with a mist. The earth was watered with a mist. And no doubt, this earth must have been one beautiful place. And, you know, I've always wondered why in, in science, they, they, how do they ever explain how all the coal and natural gas and petroleum got buried in the ground? How did it get down there? It's some great upheaval happened on this planet. And it was buried down there. Well, uh, God put it down there for a reason. And people who said, it's going to rain water from the sky, and where you're building a boat on dry land? And Noah says, yes. And those who are willing to follow God and get on are going to be saved. And let me tell you that for you and I, there's an ark being built, and it's reaching around the world in this great movement we have. And, and other people I know are contribute to it. And I think it's, things are going to happen in the future that many of us will never dream of. Uh, God is going to work miracles. And there's some things going to happen that we don't know how it's going to happen. But we've read the last chapter and we know. And so uh, as, as, we, uh, as we think of the flood and how what people must have said to Noah. So you know what? We've lived all these. I've lived hundreds of years. And things just going on like they always did. And that's exactly what people will say today. Many thinking people say, you know, things will go on. Oh, I've heard that story. Jesus coming again. But you know what? He is coming again. And, and this time he's going to destroy the people by the, the glory of his coming and the quenching fire that will go before him for those who are not ready to meet him. We are building an ark, friends. And we want to invite everybody we can to be on that ark. God calls things that are not as though they were. Though the, the third illustration I want to share with you is Daniel. Now, Daniel is, um, it, let's, if you turn with me, Daniel, the 12th chapter. And uh, Daniel chapter 12, and I want to read just one verse from Daniel. Now, Daniel has shown something's going to happen a long time in the future, way out there. He's showing something that's going to happen here. And uh, he, d he couldn't understand it all, I'm sure. God gave him some glimpse of what was going to happen. He gave him these prophecies. He gave us the, the time prophecies and how, that, uh, how that things were going to work out in the future. And we can go back and study Daniel and, and uh, we can know a lot about even the date that Christ would be born. But the point I want to make in Daniel 4, uh, 12, chapter 12, verse 4 is this. But you, Daniel, shut up the words, seal the book until the time of the end. So in the end time, the book is going to be opened. Amen? And we've been, it was open, and we've come to understand that sanctuary message and, and the cleansing of the sanctuary in 1844. We understand that now. At, at the time of the end, it was open. And it says that 
many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Now let me first take knowledge shall increase. Anybody who has a cell phone will not argue that knowledge has increased. I remember a few, several years ago, they used to say, well, knowledge doubles every 10 years. Well, I know today is, it may be every two years or every year. I don't know. I know one thing, I can't keep up with it. Uh, I can't even work the one I got. And, and uh, they, they tell there's updates, and I don't want any more updates. I'm still figuring this one out, you know. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, I made the mistake in my computer saying, well, they kept telling me they need an update. So I said, okay. It keeps popping up. I'll say, okay. Uh, and it's been a mess ever since. You know, so knowledge is increasing, no question. There's really two meanings to this text, though. Number one is spiritual. It's a spiritual meaning. Knowledge will increase. Knowledge will increase about the scriptures. We know more now about the scriptures and prophecy. And we can talk about America and prophecy and what the Bible says. We can study that. Oh, we can, uh, knowledge increase technically, obviously. And everybody would agree to that. Spiritually, it, it has increased. But then it says that men would run to and fro. Okay, if you've ever been on 85 when, when it hadn't blown up, <laughs> you know, and you see a rush hour, you see all these people coming and going. And sometimes I, I ask myself when I get on there, where are all these people coming from? And where are they all going? I mean, it's like, it's so many people. We're like ants. We just move around like ants today in a city like this. People run to and fro, but what it also means is the gospel is running to and fro too. We're taking it to places today. The tentacles of God's church is reaching further and further and more and more places. The tentacles of his church. Now, some things haven't happened in North America the way it has happened in other places. And I like to give the example of Zambia. When we left Africa in 1982, they had, it's a small country, it's not a big population, about just like Florida. They had 40,000 members and so proud of reaching 40,000. But today there's a million members there. There's a million, it was about the same thing as Zimbabwe. And today there's a million members there. It is exploded in some places. Now, it hasn't happened here. In fact, I'm told by someone who went to church where I grew up as a child in Portales, New Mexico, I lived there till I was 16, a small town, that they once had a thriving church there and had a church school. And I think today there's just a few members there and they go to the neighboring town of Clovis. I don't understand why we're not winning people there and, and here like we should be. But I know that God has surprises in store. We don't know how all this is going to develop. We don't know how it's going to work. But when we look back, our hindsight is so much better. than, than our, We tend to see things as they are around us and, and judge things as they are happening around us. But God is in control. He is sovereign. And it says, God calls things that do not exist as if they were. And all that petroleum is buried, is used now to make us carry the gospel quickly to so many places. Uh, I don't know exactly what God had in mind and all that, but I know that's true. Daniel 12 verse 4 says, the knowledge will increase and people will run to and fro. And surely today we can run to and fro and... Um, and well, there's a, Daniel's prophecy comes true, and some of the knowledge that will be given is, and I want you to turn with me to Revelation, the uh, 12th chapter, <clears throat> and verse 4. I mean, I'm sorry, verse 6. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 6. Now, part of what Daniel saw is this prophecies and this knowledge that would be increased. And Daniel's, and, and God revealed this to John also in the book of Revelation. Many of the very same things as in Daniel is in Revelation. And God, God showed him this picture. And sure, I'm sure he didn't, when he recorded this, didn't understand all of it. But it talks about the, uh, the end time. And, uh, and, Starting with verse 6. Um, let's see, I'm not looking at the right chapter. Hang on, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, and starting with verse 6. 
And it talks about this end time people. Who are they? Who are these people that's going to go and do all this? Who is it? You know, when you think about the Sabbath message alone, when this little group of Adventists were meeting back there in, in uh, New England, and they had this sanctuary message, and they're preaching it. And this young lady who was a Seventh-day Baptist comes to hear them. And she said, if you guys really want to follow the Bible, why don't you keep the Seventh-day Sabbath? And there was a Methodist preacher there who said, well, I don't know what you're talking about. And he began to study it. And she left a track with him. And he became a convert. And he began preaching it and teaching it. And it became part of the great Advent movement. At that time, there were 50,000 Seventh-day Baptists in the world. Today, there's 50,000 Seventh-day Baptists in the world. But there was at least a little group of 100 or so believers that putting all this together, how God was using them. Today, there's 20 million members, and it grows by a million a year. And it, it's God, what he's got in the future, I don't know. I know it's going to be big. It's getting big, and it's getting bigger, and it's growing everywhere. But look at this group. How does he identify them? He said, I saw, this is the three angels message of Revelation 14. It said, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. Now, you know this text well, but you say, I want you to say it with me. How far is it going to go? To every, what, nation, kin, tri tribe, tongue, and people. To every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. That's where it's going to go. It's, that's how far it's going to go. And, and it goes on to describe this movement as these three angels begin to spread this gospel around the world. And go down to verse 12. It identifies the people a little better. It identifies this group even better that God had planned for this last day that really Daniel foresaw. And it says in verse 12, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep what? The commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Some group is going to appear on the scene in this end time who keep the commandments of God. All ten of them. Amen? Amen. They, they keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. You know, uh, it, it puts it pretty plain who this group is. And, and uh, you know what? I praise the Lord to be part of it. it it's... Uh, this group, God called, calls things that are not as if they were. So it's, it's, he's told John what this group's going to be like. Well, it hadn't all evolved back then and had to wait till this time come for us to see this. Well, let's go on. Something else it says about this group. Let me tell you, it goes on to identify them in chapter 19. And I want to just uh, read to you the last line of chapter 17, uh, verse, verse 10. The 10th verse of 19. And I just, I just want to read the last line. I'm not going to read the other part. But this is what's really important to our understanding. This group that God told us about. It says, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of what? Prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So this group will have the spirit of prophecy. Not only do they keep all the commandments... And, and they also, it says that they would tell people to worship. Uh, uh, maybe I didn't read that part of it uh, here back in, in the first, previous reason, but it said that they would turn people to look toward the Creator about the one who made the earth, the sea, and all the waters. That's talking about the Creator, how they would point people back. And of course, when we keep the Sabbath, it points back to creation, to the God, the Creator, and how important that is. Well, so this describes this group, the spirit of prophecy. We have, God has given it to this church. Now, I don't know what else God's going to do in the end, but I want to tell you something. Uh, there's a difference between a messenger of God and a false messenger. A false messenger would give messages that maybe come true sometimes. Gene Dixon used to be, years ago, was a big popular one. Uh, and she'd tell some, predict some things, and some of it came true, but a lot of stuff didn't come true. And, and people like to, uh, on TV, they like to go back to Notre Dame, and they're not sure what this meant and what he said. Well, he may have got some things right, I don't know, but he got a lot of things wrong, and we know that. So uh, a true prophet 
would, would tell us things that would really happen and it would come true. A true messenger of the Lord. And I want to tell you, God gave us a true messenger of the Lord in Ellen G. White. When this little group was beginning, she told her husband, you must, James, you must begin to print a paper. It's going to be a success from the first. God has shown me you must print a paper. And they had no money. He cut hay to, to, to pay for the first printing. And, and uh, this is the 1840s. And he's, but he went out, and sure enough, money came. She said, God has shown me money will come to print this paper. If you will just print it and send it out. And they did. They printed it on credit. And, and uh, they paid some, but they had to get some of it on credit, and the money came. And that was started the Adventist publishing work. Today, we have, we have publishing houses, and 300 or more. I don't know exactly how many. There was 350 at one time. But there's publishing houses in countries all over the world spreading this three angels message. Amen? Amen. She said it'd be, a, like a, it'd be a success from the beginning. You can't explain that. And all the, of course, there's other forts of print now, and that is through television, radio, and all these other ways that it's going out. But it's because God gave this vision to this church. Let me, sh let me share another one with you. She uh, was in, in, when the church headquarters were in Battle Creek, Michigan, she had this vision, and she wrote, out the man she wrote a manuscript after this. She said, God has shown me that, that there is a, there's a, a old slave plantation in Alabama. She had never been to Alabama. It said there's a slave plantation there, and they will sell it to us. And, we, and God has said that we need to build a college there at, for the colored people and uh, people of color, anyway, people of African descent. And so she wrote this manuscript out. She gave it to the brethren. Everybody forgot about it. She put it was one in her home. It ended up in her attic. And one day she had an eccentric son named Ed Edison who was an interesting character and himself. Edison was wandering around up there and he found this and he read it. He said, Mom, why haven't anybody done anything about this? So she, I took it back to the headquarters and they read it and they thought about it and they said, okay, like a good Adventist group, they formed a committee and sent a committee down from Battle Creek. Now imagine this in the 1800s. They sent a, a, a committee from Battle Creek down to Huntsville, Alabama. And travel was not as convenient today. They couldn't get on Delta, I tell you. They, they had, it was a trip. But she said, God has shown me they will sell that to us. When they got down there, these people said, we don't know who you are and who told you that we'd, we'd sell this farm, but this has been our, our home for generations. And uh, they said, anyway, they just said, forget it. We're not interested. And they went back. Well, when they got, that, got back, Ellen White says, look, the Lord has shown me they will sell it to us. Go back again. So they went back again from Battle Creek to Huntsville, Alabama. Imagine that today. If you knew a messenger, someone said they're a messenger from the Lord, and you knew them and they got tired and they had to get sleep, they get sick and all the things, you'd say, eh, maybe not, you know. It would, you'd question it. But she said, no, God has shown me. Go back so this, they went the second time. The second time they said, look, you guys are crazy. We don't know where you got this idea, but we're not interested in selling this. So they went back the second time. To, the third time they got there, Ellen White says, go back. God told me, go back, go back. They will sell it. And they went back and they said, you know, since you were here last time, we have decided that we will sell this. Amen. And that is became Oakwood College to train pastors, teachers, and, of course, doctors and everything else. Accountants have come out of there. And uh, there is a slave graveyard there on that place. But imagine uh, it says God calls things Amen. that are not as though they were. How God took a, a plantation and 
turned it from a slave plantation into a place where people will be trained to go around the world. And some of the best preachers in Adventism are trained at Oakwood College. I'll tell you that. I, I've heard a lot of them preach, and I, they're always some of my favorite. Well, that's, that's, that, that is, there was a spirit of prophecy in this church that helped us do that. Let me just share one other with you. Loma Linda University. We had a medical college, and it was in, in Bar uh, up in uh, Battle Creek. And this, this genius doctor, Dr. Kellogg, who ran it, people, all the wealthy people of America went there to be treated. And they, uh, the, it, was, it was well known, world famous. And the building is still there. And if you're ever up there, you owe it to yourself to take a tour of that building. You can get one. It is, it is a mammoth building that's still there of the old Kellogg uh, Medical Center, Sanitarium, as it was called. And uh, anyway, but he got proud and important, and he went off track, totally lost his way spiritually and every other way. And uh, he, we lost that. He took it away. It was the Adventist tr hopeful training future for doctors, medical doctors. But she was out in California, had a small church out there. Church just, the Golden West is when gold was discovered. When Adventists went there, it grew rapidly then, back then. And uh, we had a few members, and they had a vision, and they bought a couple of hospitals, uh, took over them, and they were operating them. And, but Ellen White had a vision. And she wrote it out. She said, the Lord told us that there is a place near Redlands, California, that God has shown me. And he's shown me the trees on it. And she described the place that's already prepared for a sanitarium. They, this is all prepared. Uh, and we can, we can get that. The God said, We're, the Lord's going to give that to us. And I uh, said, so I've seen it. And she described it. And she had a young preacher she liked that was kind of a go-getter. And she said, I want you to go down there and search for that. And he did around Redlands, and eventually he found this place. It was a it was a retirement center of, had been built. There had been four different businesses took over that. One of them had 50 doctors. They were going to build a health sanitarium themselves, but somehow they all went bankrupt. Every business that had run that went bankrupt, and uh, they kept uh, trying to sell it, and the price kept coming down and coming down. And uh, when it got low enough, uh, White told him, says, go borrow $500 somewhere from some of our members and go hold that property while we raise money. We'll raise money for that. Now, that is, that is a visionary. Well, it's a, even make it more complicated, the general conference told them, do not buy another or start another hospital. You've got two there. You can't afford it. You don't have many members there. And... We can't support that, and, and it's just not good business. Do not do that. But, but she had a vision, and, and she, she shared it with others and said, God has caught, said this, and, and as the text says, God calls things that are not as though they were. You know, uh, they, they managed to scrape. They said, well, you have to pay 5000 to this date, and then there was a few weeks later, they'd come up with another 5000 Well, they got the first 5000 but the other 5000 they could not get it. They couldn't find it. And they thought, we're going to lose our 5000 And they were in a prayer meeting one morning, the, the very day that they had to come up with it. There was no money. And the very day they were there, they're in a prayer meeting. And they heard the mailman walk across the front porch. And they said, well, let's check the mail and see if there's anything in the mail. And when they went to the mail, there was a letter there from a lady from uh, Atlantic City, New Jersey. Nobody knew her. Nobody ever heard of her. And nobody has heard of her since. And that was a check for $5,000. So at that stage, the church got on board. They said there wasn't a dry in the place when that happened. And, and uh, it, the, the, the general conference even gave in and said, well, we can see the Lord is in this. And uh, they, they, uh, they, they went ahead with uh, 
supporting it. And of course today, let me tell you something today. Loma Linda produced, and since its inception in, in 1905, has produced more doctors than any university. They graduate 150 a year. That's more than Stanford or Southern Cal, those big schools out there. But they produce more doctors uh, since uh, of any university west of the Mississippi. Now, maybe some on the East Coast might have, but uh, on the West Mississippi, they produce more doctors than any other university in America Amen. in that area. Well, my fourth way I want to mention here that God calls things some of the most least likely people. God reaches down and touches people. The fourth place is, is individuals, how God calls what is not, and he makes them uh, his person, his spoke person. And uh, there's so many, there's so many people like that. And, and maybe some of us are that way. And we, we're not, but somehow we, uh, it, the Lord reached down and touched us, you know, and, and he found us. One was John, was uh, John Newton. John Newton was a slave trader. He was a sea captain. He went to sea, uh, uh, just a little boy. His dad took him away. He was a sea captain. And he took him to sea, and he learned to be a sea captain. And he, uh, he got to where he was, he had a triangle of, that he made. And one of the triangles, part of the triangle, was going from North America, uh, or from somewhere in Europe. And then he went to Africa, picked up slaves, and he brought them to North America. And uh, I can't think of anybody being much more depraved than that. But... You know, uh, the Lord got a hold of him and converted him. And he wrote, he, he wrote this amazing grace, page 100, uh, it's 108 in our hymnal. And he wrote these lines. I think of this. He said, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. And then the last, I love the last line of this. It's, he's talking about when we've been there 10,000 years. He says, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright and shining as the sun, we've no less time to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Amen. You know, such an inspired film, uh, uh, hymn, I think. God is calling people today, too. He's calling you, and he's calling others. And, dear friends, we're going to sing a closing song. And if uh, you put that on for us, Steve. This is a little scripture song that I hope that, um, hope that you will like. You see, our hindsight is so much better. And we look back from eternity, we're going to see, we're going to see that uh, if, if uh, this, that God works this way. And, and we're going to look back and say, yeah, we can praise the Lord. We can say in God's time, this is Ecclesiastes uh, 11 verse 3. And I just want to say, if there's someone here today that wants, that maybe has said, you know, I feel God calling me. And if you'd like, if you'd like to come down and accept the Lord today, I invite you today to come down as we sing this song. And I'm going to hold my prayer till after the song. And so let's sing this song. And I, you may not all know it, but I think if we sing it through two or three times that you'll get it. stand.
let's just uh, let's sing it through one more time. If there's anybody here who'd like to say, you know, today, I want to dedicate my life to, to the Lord again. If there's anybody that'd like to do that, I invite you to come down. We want to have prayer together, and I'll pray for you at the close of the hymn. Okay, let's sing it one more time. Thank you. It's time. Heavenly Father, thank you today that we have the promise that you can take things that aren't and make them. We thank you, dear Father, that some of the things that people maybe seem most unlikely, and I know that's true of me, that uh, you can call them. You can call those individuals and change their life. And we pray if there's any like that today. We just pray today that they would invite you into their heart as never before. I thank you for these individuals that come forward. Dear Lord, whatever their burden is today, I pray that you will hear their special burden. You know what it is. Mm -hmm. I pray, dear Father, you put your hand upon them and bless them today, and we thank you for them. And if there's any others that want to come down, we just pray, dear Lord, you'd bless them, and we just thank you that in your time, our hindsight is going to be so good. And we're going to see how you'd led us and how you call things that that we people could never have thought of. And and your great church, this worldwide movement, we thank you we're part of it. Amen. We thank you for the spirit of prophecy that's come and given us so much counsel. Dear Father, we thank you for that help that's made us what we are today. Dear Lord, uh, we just want to ask today your blessings upon these individuals in a special way and bless our whole congregation. Bless us, dear Father, as we go out into the mission field that you'd help us to be faithful and share in our faith and, and keep us, we pray, in, in your good stand. We know, dear Father, that Abraham was not perfect and Noah was not perfect, but because they had faith. Your word tells us that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And we know that you've promised that Abraham, because he believed and followed, it says that you accounted to, it, to him for righteousness. Thank you, dear Father, for hearing our prayer. Thank you for each of these individuals that came forward. And thank you for every member of this congregation. Bless it and bless our pastor, wherever he is today, we pray. Thank you again for your love to us and the great hope we have in your son, Jesus. For we ask it all in his name. Amen. Amen.